Hello and welcome to the Getting There Show, where we speak with brilliant people and unpack the key influences and decisions that have helped them get to where they are today. You'll get the books, the mental models, the inspirations, and all the steps in their journey to help guide you on your own path. As Isaac Newton said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Today's giant is a great guy called Charlie Deedingpole, who after getting a degree at Cambridge, joined JP Morgan in their M&A division, before launching a company called Market Invoice, and then most recently launching a business called Comply Advantage, a massively successful fintech company that has raised £100 million to help financial institutions combat money laundering and financial terrorism. We discuss a whole bunch of things here, like how he sees the fintech opportunity, how he breaks down a business into two simple functions, how to land jobs in startups and scale-ups, and why product is everything. As always, we make sure to include all of Charlie's toolkit and influencers in the show notes, so as to maximize the chances that this show helps you get to where you want to get to. So, Charlie, um, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Great to reconnect, Fred, on this amazing Sunday evening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how's, how's lockdown been for you? Um, for me, I think, um, like, I'm not like a kind of blue-collar worker who's been forced to work from home and um, uh, unable to do any work for the past, like, year and a half. So I think, like, um, like fine, I guess. Um, I guess as a company, we've had a great year and grown, raised $50 million back in July. Um, we've hired some great people. So I think despite the pandemic, the company and myself have been, like, in a good position. Right. And how has the company adapted to remote working? So we gave up our London office um, end of the year and that saved us two million pounds a year. So um, I think everything already was kind of cloud hosted. So um, we've now hired more people who aren't in the main hub. So we have people already in New York, Singapore, um, Transylvania, London. Um, We now hire people in like Atlanta and France and um, Timisoara. So like, you know, kind of, whereas previously we were very much like three hubs, now we've kind of gone much more distributed. So if the pandemic lasts a lot longer, it, it would be interesting to see how how much we revert to any kind of like actual on-premise um, mm. like configuration. And if you were to, you know, place a bet today, um, would you say that you will revert back to, to more um, office um, base working or will you keep a more distributed team um so i think one thing you could do is rather than having everyone meet in a central location is you could hold kind of monthly offsites at cool places and make it much more of a kind of team bonding social cohesion type element um and then for kind of one day a week you host actual meetings face to face so i think i think talking to other people um the the, the the kind of atrophy of the existing configuration, like uh, and then kind of half life, is it, kind of increasing by the day. So I think I think over time, potentially, we might just say, "Listen, everything's working great as it is," um, and let's just carry on. Mm. I also think, from a talent perspective, you know, it opens up the business to talent from you know every single country in the world. Um, so it'd be a very interesting to see whether. Um, you know, you, you see a sort of benefit um, there as well. If you want the best people, then really, are you going to be forced to, to offer them the kind of working style that they want? Um, if you're going head to head with like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, then, and, and they're offering remote working, then um, you have to too. So um, to some extent, employees are going to vote with their feet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, great. So the first question we like to ask, Charlie, is, and how did you get to where you are today? It would be brilliant if you could give a little potter's history of um, university right up to, uh, to, to the present moment. So I started my first website when I was like 16. So I was kind of built and learned how to code and launched it. And that became um, Student Room, um, which is now like still a big website. Um, and I guess my first term at university that was producing like £2,000 a day in revenue with, with, with no work, right? So um, I guess from that, I kind of learned that I enjoyed running a company, but I didn't know very much about it. So 
um, after Cambridge, um, I went to Jacob Morgan, did TMT M&A, um, learned what I could from that with CEOs of big tech companies, um, and then started, um, which is where I met you back in, I think, 20, 2009 probably, right? Um, it was, yeah. So I started to go to peer-to-peer fintech lender after the financial crisis, and then this company I started back in 20, 2014. So, um, and now with Comply Vantage, we're kind of doing um, sanctions, money laundering, so kind of anti-terrorist financing, data and software. And we've raised nearly $100 million, um, currently 270 people. Um, and yeah, I think it's um, going very well so far. Right. And we dig a li- little bit um, into Comply Advantage and, and you know, the, the, the problem that you, you guys solve. Back in 2014, uh, I spoke to some people about the kind of key problems that were, kind of, that were kind of going on. And a lot of people who are in banks mentioned this thing called compliance. And um, I guess with my second company, I was the nominated money laundering reporting officer, which meant that I would go to jail if something went wrong. So we were taking millions and millions of pounds from people all over the world to funnel into small companies over a, a kind of eBay for invoices type model. And you know, you're under pressure to build a company and grow. And yet you have to look after this money laundering thing, right? And it's like, it, it was the bit of the company that I hated the most. And I guess I wanted I never really enjoyed doing a bad job at anything. And I felt it was so important, but yet it, you're never going to prioritize um, money laundering because you want to grow revenue. It's, it's, it's often seen as not being a competitive advantage. Um, so the first client we had was a Somali remittance firm sending money to Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, based in Mayfair, opposite the Saudi embassy, um, so we built for them a kind of very advanced system and database um, based upon what I knew from my first two companies. And also in terms of being able to use machine learning and AI, like all that technology was kind of, you know, like 2010, um, Google, Amazon, Facebook, very small companies. Um, now, like absolutely vast and all the talent, all the open source software, all the cloud infrastructure has really changed what's possible in technology. And so we've been the beneficiary of being able to apply that to a very difficult problem to solve. And, and back, you know, pre-comply advantage. Um, so when you were at market invoice, you know, trying to, trying to work on the compliance um, activities for the business, was it very manual? Like, was it very laborious? Like what, what made you, where, where was the light bulb moment? I think at JP Morgan, I had worked with the companies doing it. So Redals Bay, Dow Jones, LexisNexis, WorldCheck. And um, I guess I didn't find them particularly impressive when I met them, as in the management teams. Um, And so when I saw the software, equally, I wasn't really impressed either. And I could see very clearly how you could revolutionize it, as in the people who are doing the operational friction elements of it, as a betting the people, they... Um, would have to wait half an hour for the system to process the transactions, right? So it's just, it's just kind of like a sclerotic, terrible software because they've grown by m and So um, that, that for me, both in terms of the industry structure and also the kind of products that were being offered made it very obvious that it needed to be ripped apart. Mm-hmm. And I know as um, you, know, you, you, you obviously run Comply Advantage, but you're also quite an active angel investor in, in fintech. So you, you've invested in companies like Tax Scouts and uh, Credit Kudos. Why do you think there is such a, still such a big opportunity in, in fintech? So I think uh, in terms of, if you look at the situation back in 2009, at least in the UK, you had kind of five big banks that had grown via M&A and not many providers. So um, I think it wasn't very common to launch a fintech company back in 2009, as in to be regulated and to go and get a license. It was kind of, I, I think um, that was kind of around the same time that Andrews and Horowitz had this software will eat the world mantra. And therefore, if you want to start a company, it's fairly easy just to kind of hire a developer and attack the space. So um, I think in terms of operational friction, in terms of labor costs going up, in terms of, you know, you, you, like with AWS, you can get a, a server running in seconds and you can scale it horizontally. Um, you can get off the shelf software to do most of the backend interface, like, you know, fairly quickly and cheaply, you can launch a company. 
um, and that's only become easier. So I think I think the costs have declined, the opportunities have increased because of global markets, everyone's online, the app store. Um, and I think technical debt means that the incumbents can't really react, as in they might have 50 systems to process a loan, or they might have no ability to see who their customers are or analyze them. So um, I think a lot of the thesis is around fixing all this, as in it's kind of fundamentally broken and anyone that can really see what's happening in terms of their customers or um, forms of risk like credit default can, can really do really well. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I always um, was interested in the company Microfocus, which I think yeah. is one of the largest you know, tech companies. Cool. And, and yeah, and they, um, you know, their, their main you know, value prop was to help big banks you know, make their legacy technology um, yeah. um, you know, work better. Um, and I always think it's quite interesting seeing that there's actually a whole company dedicated to you know, just, just maintaining legacy IT. I mean, I think lots of the banks are kind of parodies of bad companies. They said that they might have had a, a kind of a, a kind of COBOL box in the in 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 in, in the building which, which couldn't be turned off, right? So um, I think the advantages like like structural advantages are starting from scratch on a technology greenfield. Um, and then iterating, you know, you see Monzo, which didn't have to buy five servers, a banking call, which could launch and iterate fast and offer new services and experiences. So um, once you get into the details of the technology and the strategies that follow from that, then there are also opportunities. And do you still think there are opportunities out there in fintech? I mean, since you launched Comply Advantage, fintech has exploded, you know, particularly in London. Um, but as an angel investor, are you still... Are you still bullish about you know, new companies arising and, and, and really making a difference? I think you've seen in the past few months, you've seen um, Clubhouse launch from nowhere to massive scale. You've seen, I think, on Friday, Fast, which is a single sign-on, yeah. launch to a billion in a year. So I think... Got Stripe investment, didn't they? So um, our investor from Index, he did the pre-seed, right? Okay. Um, so he, he, he's on the board of Robin Hood. He led the Andy N investment. So like, you know, like... He, he managed to take a company from pre-seed to unicorn in like 18 months, right? So I think, I think um, people are building massive companies extremely quickly. And a lot of our audience want to set up their own companies, but they, they work in you know, banking or, or management consulting. Um, a question I'd like to ask is, why did you set up your own business? Um, I'd done it when I was 16 and I knew I was good at it and um, I've been like working on that since day one. So um, it's what I enjoy, right? Um, And I think that's like my my kind of natural state as in, I think um, if you're like ambitious and you like kind of working hard on a hard project with a team without any constraints, then that's attractive. Whereas I think if you're kind of I, I, if you're in the bowels of a massive corporation and you have to wait 50 years to get promoted, then it's like, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't seem like a great, great option to us. And Steve Jobs has that quote, you know, better to be a pirate than in the Navy. I yeah. guess you're, you're more of a pirate. Yeah. I think um, it's definitely more fun. But I, I also kind of, I think to some extent, the kind of, the, the, the kind of um, drug of, um, endorphins, like, and then they're kind of lows in terms of like, you know, you're not sure if it's going to work out. You take a risk. Um, suddenly you close a big deal or, you know, the thing you're trying, like, like, I think if you're building a company, it can be months before it pays off, but then and you're going to heads down, like hammering away, but eventually it works. Right. So, um, and then, and then that kind of buzz will last for like three days, I think. Right. So, um, I think ultimately that's what you do it for, right? You do it for kind of the enjoyment or the people you meet. But I think fundamentally you do it because it's fun to like win and um, do cool stuff. And so what would your top tips be for people who you know, are wanting to set up their own company, but you know, don't have an entrepreneurial background um, and but you know that they, they have an idea and they, they want to try it out? I mean, I've invested in some companies which worked at companies that I started and they've done very well um, because it, I guess they could see how, how the company functioned and make contacts and had experience of a fast growing company. Um, and that's kind of a big advantage, I think. I think if you have no way of looking at 
how a sales team is built or how a tech team is run or how a product manager functions, then um, it, it's hard enough as it stands. But you, know, you, you wouldn't kind of build a coal mine without understanding some geology and you wouldn't try and launch like a solar farm without understanding. You know, like there are always some technical skills you need to master. Mm-hmm. Um, and also if you want to raise money, then you have some credibility. But then, yeah, I, I think the, 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 the kind of failure rate is so high that um, you want to tilt the odds in your favor as much as possible. And so your advice would be to, to actually go and work in a startup or a scale-up and um, acquire those, those. I think like acquire domain relevant experience, either of what you think is good or bad in terms of like, you know, I, I think so like climb the right ladder and subordinate your action towards the end goal. Um, I think um, work, work with people who are smart, who you, who you trust, who think are good, right? So um yeah, I think I think um, climb the right ladder, right? And um, in terms of, I mean, that's a nice segue onto the next question. So, I mean, I, I see that comply advantage are hiring a lot. Um, so, in terms of skills that you think are, um, are are most relevant for scale up environments, what 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 do you typically look for? Fundamentally, you're either like building or selling in a company. As in, you're either writing the software, defining the product, or you you you're working on the positioning. Um, or you're supporting that. You're doing the accounting, the legal. So you need to have some sort of skill that's relevant. So um, I think in terms of general management, um, I think you need to have something relevant to offer the company. Um, you can't just go in as CEO or COO on day one, right? I think it's. Um, I think you need to offer the company something. And for every for every like 200 roles in in sales or tech, there's kind of one in management mm-hmm. I, I think people doing mbas maybe product is good or or kind of finance might be good um i think yeah i, I think the best probably product for like an mba but then again then again if, if they haven't got any kind of experience with with tech then it's kind of hard as well so mm. and um in terms of comply advantage what are your plans over the next you know one to one to five years i see you're hiring quite a lot we want to, I mean, like any kind of software company is expected to kind of triple, triple, double, double in revenue. Um, and because ultimately you want to get to IPO um, or scale, right? So, and you want to get scale now. If you're, not, if you're not growing, you're going nowhere. So you have to grow. Um, you have to grow revenue. You have to build, build a platform. You have to like build and sell, right? So, um, and therefore like since we, you know, since 2018, what have we done? We've built more pro- features and products and improved it. Um, and we've sold more of it. So, and we think it's a big market. So, you know, I, I think fundamentally it's about, you know, it's, it's much easier to double the size of an existing company than it's start another one. As in, you know, most companies can get, like, like it, 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 if you're doubling from 300 million to 600 million, that, that, that will happen in a year. Whereas getting from nothing to like a million will take you like four years, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's just, it's much easier to double what you already have than it is to start start another company. That's interesting. And in terms of your uh, the influences that have had a big impact on your life, is there a particular book that you would call out as having um, a very large impact on the way you make decisions? I mean, I think I think it's good to kind of read as many books as you can for kind of constant inspiration, as in you want to look at the biography and the story and like learn from them about their philosophy and triangulate what's a good approach. Um, I guess the, the, the book I read like last is this one, right? So this is kind of Tapes Sucks by Frank Slootman. So I guess we've all seen the Snowflake IPO. Um, it's gone from like nothing to 100 billion in the space of like, you know, three days, right? And the CEO has done it three times. So I think you know, what is, what is it about his philosophy that made him like get there? And I think anyone can have an opinion. Anyone can like, like opine and like, you know, say, Oh, you know, like, like, but ultimately do you really care about their opinion if they've done, if they haven't achieved anything, right? Like everything belongs to the person in the ring, not the kind of commentator. Right. So this guy's done it. Right. And so fundamentally his opinion is it's about action. Right. So it's about, um, hustle and energy and in the same way that a good manager can transform Man U or, or Sheffield United right like um, a good manager can transform a company too and it's all about urgency cycle speed incremental compounding velocity so I think um, 
yeah, I think I think that's what it's about, right? Just I think it's just I mean, uh, early on where you're triangulating market size or opportunities, or you know, I think now for us it's kind of action and scale and speed. And is there a particular quote that you or, or maxim that you have in the back of your mind that that has sort of guided um, your journey so far? I think um, I think so. Um, for our series of A investor, Bolton, Tim Bunting, he was kind of early on, you know, focused on having the best products. We, we took a long time building the product and launching um, before we went live. So, and that's because we wanted to like, you know, so I, I think ultimately it's, you want your product to be your marketing. So at least in terms of our strategy, we, you know, we spent hundreds of millions building the product and now we think it's the best. Um, but it, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, it, it, it's very poor before it gets good. Mm. But Elon Musk is also famous for you know, not not spending much on marketing, and he's always you know, saying that it's you know, all about product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it helps when you've got like sixty million Twitter followers as well, right? So <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, great. And let's now turn to the last section, which is all around um, interview questions. So I'd like to ask you what your favorite interview question is when you're you're hiring into your business, and then. Once you've told us what that interview question is, how would you yourself uh, answer it? I, uh, there's a thing called top grading, which when you're hiring executives, you want to do a kind of scientific assessment of their impact historically. So you want to look at like, you know, um, look at the CV and say like, okay, what did you achieve here, right? And say, and then kind of drill down and say precisely what did you do? How do you do it? Because ultimately you're hiring someone and exactly love to have an impact. Um, and so you, you, you want to go through and say, okay, you know, you spent three years at this company as, as CMO, like, you know, I think I can look at the website and, and see what you've achieved there. Um, tell me what you did, how you did it. And just kind of, as you want to really like forensically interrogate their, their, their career line by line. What's that called? Top rating. Top, top rating. Yeah. So I think it's kind of, you know, fundamentally, what did you achieve? Were you a passenger or were you the driver? And what do you do for that company? And do you do any behavioural um, sort of interviews so for the supply? Give, give like... me an example. So uh, w one of the things that Google, Facebook and Amazon are quite famous for is behavioural interviewing. So, you know, give me an example of when yeah. you have, you know, learned from failure or give me an yeah. example. When, so do you, are you big on that as well at Comply Advantage? We're quite big on like cultural questions in terms of like we have a set of values and we kind of test to what extent that people align with those values um, in terms of like drive, ambition, um, learning, improvement, teamwork. Um, so in terms of competency questions, yeah, I, I think work sample questions in terms of like, you know, um, right now for, for PR, write me a press release. Like you, that's fundamentally what they'll be doing. And then also in terms of, I think it's more useful in kind of graduate roles or kind of like, um, where they haven't got that much relevant experience, I think. So, like, or, I mean, it's very early stage screening, I think. So, yeah, it, like, it, it, it's a useful weapon in your HR arsenal, but I wouldn't rely on it, like, you know, the predictiveness for kind of the senior hires. And um, how important are your, your cultural values? Like, have, they, have they shifted over time? I think... In reality, they can mean anything you want them to mean. Um, I think cultural values are appropriate to the company you're building, as in, are you building a coal mine and therefore you need like blind obedience to process or, 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 or you're, you're manufacturing cars, right? right? For us, it's kind of like difficult, challenging, complex teamwork on some you know, research and development type scientific architecture elements. So, um, but therefore, um, what we come back to, again, is, is, is kind of right now, like getting things out, improving delivery, execution. So I think um, different values are important at different stages, but ours remain constant. Interesting. Um, so Charlie, I've got a couple more questions and they are from our community. Um, and I've got a question from a guy called Faris, who actually has some experience in reg tech, which I know is that the space in which uh, Comply Advantage play in. And his question is, how does Comply Advantage deal with big banks and their caution over um, outsourcing AML to a provider in the cloud? 
So everyone uses someone for data. No, one, no one's going to build their own data set. So um, what we do is just show that we're better because our data is generated by machines. And we also do a data test and we say, listen, like, you know, we can reduce your false positives and false negatives. So, um, yeah, I think we, we demonstrably prove that it's superior. Um, and that's why we've got so many big bank clients now is because it's the best product. And, um, yeah, this is a nice segue onto his next question. And what is comply advantage, competitive advantage? Um, so, you know, how can you go in and you know, prove that you're, you're better than the rest? So, the competitors, well, check that out, Lex Nexus, build it via people, researchers, whereas we do it via algorithms. And so, therefore, it's faster, more objective, more expansive, deeper, more connections. And also, we're kind of going beyond just bad people to every person and company in the world. So it's just kind of, it's just so broad um, that no one can, rep can replicate that. Plus 10 other advantages, but yeah, that, that's the kind of top level. Awesome. Well, Charlie, it's been a real pleasure. And um, I'm sure our audience will get a lot, a lot from this uh, chat. And uh, I'm sure quite a few of them will check out Comply Advantage. Good tomorrow, so we can yeah, absolutely. get 100 million Spotify mm -hmm. contracts. Awesome. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Fred.